Simon of Montfort was a participant in the Fourth Crusade. However, he refuses to continue being involved in the Fourth Crusade when they decide to attack a Christian city. Uh, because he believes this is a diversion from the proper vow of the crusade, which is to liberate the Holy Land. So he won't participate in the Fourth Crusade beyond that. And it's kind of interesting because later on he's going to in end up leading the Albigensian Crusade, which is kind of the first internal crusade within Christendom. So let's take a look at Simon of Montfort. Christopher Tyreman in his book God's War gives us a pretty striking image of Simon of Montfort. He was a rather tall, brawny figure, an imposing figure with an impressive mane of hair, as uh, Tyreman puts it, as evident from uh, his refusal to be involved in the, the attack on Zara in the Fourth Crusade. He, he exhibited a certain moral purity. He also was a rather impressive military commander, as, as uh, we're going to get into here. But he also w was quite ruthless in the prosecution of this crusade. And as we've all mentioned already, th there are some striking instances of cruelty and violence that took place in the Albigensian Crusade. Several massacres in which really there were some internal rules that sort of governed the conduct of warfare within Christendom as opposed to, you know, in, on crusade against an, an external enemy. Uh, the Albigensian Crusade kind of obscured a lot of that because, again, well, is this really an internal war or is this more a war against an other? It was kind of both at once, mm -hmm. and some really brutal things happened. So, Paul, I know Simon of Montfort is a favorite of yours, so I'm going to let you kind of talk about him. Uh, what do you think of Simon of Montfort, and what can we say about his, his uh, leadership in the Albigensian Crusade? He is the consummate crusader. He is arguably on par, if not exceeding. And I do I, I I use that word carefully because I don't like to throw it around. He exceeds Richard the First, in my opinion. Um, uh -oh. And the reason being, and the reason being, <laughs> and I and I I am a big fan of Richard the First. Don't get me wrong. The Coup de Leon is is a is very near and dear to my heart. But Simon is able to prosecute this war almost single-handedly. He's a northern French uh, lord. He's actually an English nobleman, which goes to show you, you know, it goes to reinforce that geographical pressure on this region that uh, England and France are both involved. He is the fifth Earl of Leicester, and in the English peerage system, Earl is as high as you get without being king or queen. He is fairly high up there in terms of this crusade. Um, you mentioned the cruelty. He is a man who has absolutely no qualms about doing the job. Um, there is a, there's a quote from the massacre at Bézier that is sometimes, uh, I've seen it misattributed to him. It's certainly not him saying it. Uh, there's no evidence whatsoever that he actually said it. But it's the spirit of this crusade that is kill them all. God will know his own. <laughs> that was actually the uh, that was the Cistercian papal legate who said that. I can't recall his name, but, but did uh, he actually Amalric. say? Did he actually say that, or is that he more actually of, did say that? Okay. He it actually did. It was in a it was in a letter to Innocent the Third, if I remember yeah. correctly. And he uh, it was one of those uh, it was one of those probably one of the most striking things ever said by a cleric uh, in the Middle Ages, but it was uh, it's also one of those reasons why you never, ever uh, piss off a Cistercian. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. yeah. I, I think, uh, yeah, yeah there, are, there are just some examples of just unbelievable brutality in this crusade, which, which for me, just it just leaves a really bad taste in my mouth, especially... Um, and I, I, the, I may be a little biased too at, at this point because I, the last book I, I read several books uh, recently about the Albigensian Crusade. And the most recent one I read was the Song of the Cathar Wars, mm. which is a uh, poem uh, written in the beautiful language of the Languedoc uh, from a essentially oh. Southern French perspective. And and uh, Simon de Montfort is very much the, the villain of, of that poem. But anyway, uh, continue on with your... Do you have more to say about uh, Simon de Montfort, uh, uh, Paul? You know, I was just going to point out um, one of the, the unique features, and we'll probably get more into this later on, 
Um, and one of the reasons why I give him the credit of exceeding Richard I um, by prosecuting this crusade almost by himself is because because this was in the uh, the heartland of Christendom. This is uh, you know Christendom's eldest daughter. This is France. Right. Uh, it's not a very big journey to to you get you know to southern France from any of the major crusading kingdoms. It's not a big deal. You know these people aren't you know, contracting ships from the Venetians. They're not traveling for years over, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten kingdoms uh, just to get to the Byzantine Empire so that they can then get down into the Holy Land. You know, these are people who can, feasibly speaking, march an army down there within the course of a, a few, you know, a week or two. Uh, they can, you know, get down there with their entire baggage supply and be set up you know, a month after leaving home, ready to besiege uh, a city. You know, this right. does not take very long to march down to France. It's so a very accordingly, crusading location. <laughs> it really is. You know, if you're going to go on crusade, you might as well do it in your neighbor's backyard. Uh, and, and I think, yeah, and I think this this comes to a very important point, which I think you're you're getting at, uh, Paul, which is that the Albigensian Crusade kind of becomes sort of a easy destination for people looking to pick up an indulgence, right? Absolutely it does. Um, when, the pope, when the Pope offers indulgences, um, you know, it goes along with, of course, the same, uh, the language of being pilgrims to the Holy Land and all of this. But uh, these people don't stay. They, they come down and they take vows for 40-day periods at a time. They are literally battling for just over a month, and then they turn around and leave. So Simon de Montfort, you know, like Richard, you know, Richard the First is over in the Holy Land, and I'm going to keep drawing this parallel throughout this this discussion. Um, Richard the First's men don't have anywhere to go until Richard leaves. You right. know, they're not going anywhere until the king leaves. You know, because they're stuck there. They're not. It's not the next county over. You know. Simon de Montfort is there with people who are literally coming from the next county over, from Auvergne, from uh, you know, Gas from the Duchy of Gascony, from Aquitaine, from Perigord, from Limoges. Uh, you know, these people are coming into Toulouse, staying for a month, and then you know, fighting in maybe a battle or two, and then leaving. And he has a, an army that is fluid, and that's just unheard of at this point in time. And, you know, something that I don't know if we've touched on it or not, I can't remember. Um, but, uh, at, you know, in this southern area, and, and it does lead into uh, the brutality aspect, we also have to deal with uh, large armies of mercenary soldiers. Mm -hmm. who oh, are, yes. Yeah, that, that is an important issue. That would, uh, because of the lack of military obligations in this region, everybody was hiring mercenaries. And so this, even before the Albigensian Crusade, this region was, was kind of lawless and violent in a lot of respects because there were so many mercenary groups running around. It is, right and that, absolutely, and that, and that tradition never dies in this area. Um, much later on, in fact, one of the first cases that I know of of stolen identity actually takes place in the Languedoc region because a guy just gets up and runs off and becomes a mercenary. And then somebody else comes back and takes his place and pretends to be him. Mm -hmm. um, and that's in the 16th century, much later on. But, you know, this, this mercenary life is certainly no stranger to Toulouse, uh, to the county of Toulouse. And Simon de Montfort is not only able to prosecute successfully the war and win his battles with this lack of military temporal support, but then in, thir in um, 1213, the Pope, Pope Innocent III is looking at getting another crusade going in the east, so he pulls the offer of papal indulgences from, out from underneath Simon de Montfort's feet. So now he isn't even doing this necessarily with the blessing of the papacy, and he's still able to largely you know, hold on enough that he isn't really be, beaten back. It's really only right. his death that kind of... Uh, spells the end, uh, you know, the beginning of the end for this crusade. And that just shows how important he was. Thanks for watching. This channel posts a new video or podcast every Monday.
My historical novel, Why Does the Heathen Rage, is available now on Amazon. Click on the link in the info box below the video to get your copy. Also, check out the Real Crusades History blog at realcrusadeshistory.com, where Dr. Helena Schroeder posts a weekly article on Crusades history.